Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our life care planning series. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, we are going to get started. We are covering part three today of uh, our speaker series, Veteran Benefits for Long-Term Care, which will complete our three-part series. This series is presented by Mary Frances Price and sponsored uh, by Cassia. Christine Drasher, who has been moderating, moderating the last two sessions, uh, is out today on a well-deserved vacation. Uh, Shelly Krieger, Regional Director of Sales and Marketing, as well as myself, Craig McDaniels, will be assisting Mary uh, with the slide deck and uh, your questions uh, today. Shelly, take it over. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the name Cassia, I'll offer just a bit of background and context. Augustana Care and Elam Care came together to form Cassia in 2018. Those two communities uh, have a combined 215 years of experience providing housing, health care, and community based services to older adults. Cassia offers those services in Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Residents, patients, and clients can find independent and assisted living communities, memory support, care suites, adult day services, rehabilitation, and skilled nursing all at Cassia. We have the privilege of serving approximately 9,000 people in senior housing and skilled care. Uh, and please note that we're including a location guide similar to this at the end of the presentation, which will be included with the slide deck that's emailed to you. We can go ahead to the next slide, please. Cassia also partners in ownership with independent service providers such as Centrix Rehab, Pro Rehab, Grace Hospice, and Guardian Angels Home Care and Hospice. Cassia owns additional service lines, positioning our organization to be a full service provider, really a one-stop shop, if you will. Additional service lines include A&E Pharmacy, a medical supply company called Elam Preferred Services, and assistive technologies through the Cassia Learning Lab. And back to you, Craig. All right, thank you. So some of you may have uh, joined us for estate planning part one and um, paying for long-term care in part two. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention in part two a couple weeks back, uh, Mary covered the specifics on paying for long-term care with these various payers here. And please know that many of our Cassia communities uh, accept these various payers that you see on your screen here. HUD section eight, elderly waiver, uh, housing support with payment rates, uh, Medicaid, MA, Minnesota specific there, certainly private pay. Today we're covering uh, veterans benefits. So if you wanna learn more about uh, these various payers, um, please go to cassialife.org and look for a specific Cassia community. Once you connect with the community that you're interested in, either for yourself or a loved one, um, the community uh, marketing director or housing director will be able to share more information with you in terms of which payers they accept uh, and availability. Uh, the, the prior sessions, uh, we have recordings and handouts uh, located at the uh, link there that you see online, augustanacare.org, get to know us, uh, you'll see everything right there. And this uh, session uh, and handouts will be placed out there as well. Uh, give us some time as um, uh, Christine is, is out on vacation here for a little bit, but those will be posted. In addition, if you all that are listening today have uh, topics that you're interested in learning more about, please uh, email uh, Christine uh, dot Drasher at CassiaLife.org and uh, she will take that into account for you and um, we'll, we are looking at uh, more series ahead coming this fall. So with that, 
Um, our speaker today, of course, is Mary Frances Price, elder law attorney with Long, Rear, Hanson and Price. Um, Mary focuses on serving individuals and families with estate planning, legal, medical, and financial impacts of aging. Uh, Mary's an expert in estate planning and the ins and outs of uh, paying for long-term care. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Mary Frances Price. Mary. Thank you, Craig, and thank you again to Cassia for um, helping to get the word out about our um, sessions the past um, month or so. Um, we're excited today to talk about a topic that is often overlooked um, in the process of evaluating um, how to put together a budget to pay for long-term care. Um, so, the, and of course, that's the veterans benefit topic. And so, um, I like to think, I, I call myself sometimes the accidental expert in Minnesota on um, veterans benefits, and that's because um, I did not set out early in my law practice thinking I'm going to be, you know, uh, focusing on veterans benefits. The truth is, um, the firm I was working for years ago decided that this would be a good thing um, to have as part of our practice, and I went to tra training in um, Tampa, Florida, I think it was in and around 2007, 2008, and became an accredited VA attorney, went through some training, and that's really where the journey began. And since that time, um, I've been really working with veterans and their families to try and understand what benefits are available, but also, and also important, how to access benefits. So we're gonna go through some of that today. And um, one of the first things to be aware of if you are a veteran or you are the family member of a veteran um, is you know, making sure that the person or people you're working with to access benefits are actually um, people that have the authority to do that before the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so just a little bit of history, some of the benefits we're gonna talk about today, um, for years there were insurance brokers, um, sometimes even home care agencies, but mostly financial professionals that were trying to help people access veterans benefits, but they were doing so by selling financial services um, and products, insurance products. So the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Office of General Counsel in Washington, D.C. became very concerned about that and um, has provided some rules and laws around really who you should be engaging with if you're trying to understand and access um, veterans benefits. You can work or if, if you, a family member can be appointed to help communicate with the department on behalf of a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran. There are um, people called accredited agents and of course accredited attorneys. That would be, um, I, I would be an example of an accredited attorney. There are others in the state, but there are also non-attorney agents that have gone through some, uh, a process to be screened and allowed to work with families. Of course, we, in our count, each county, your county of residence, we have agents that we call veteran service um, officers. So your county veteran service officer. And then we also have um, veteran service organizations like VFW or American Legion that may also have um, agents that are accredited and would be a, a trusted resource on accessing veterans benefits. So just if you're thinking about veterans benefits, just make sure you're working with somebody who's knowledgeable, that is um, not just knowledgeable, but also has the legal authority to help you um, access and understand what benefits might be out there. So when we're talking about veterans benefits, there are two main sources. Um, so Craig, if you can jump to the next slide. So when we're just making sure we understand today, as I work through some of the um, topics, we wanna orient ourselves. There are two main sources for veterans benefits. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs through the federal government, and then also the, um, the, there are state specific benefits. Of course, today I'll be focusing um, primarily on Minnesota as it relates to state benefits. So, um, Probably the most notable benefit in, for Minnesota residents would be access to the Minnesota veterans' homes. Um, so Minnesota um, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs 
operates at this time four skilled nursing and memory care communities. Um, locations include Twin Cities, Silver Bay, Laverne, and Fergus Falls. Uh, there is funding for additional homes. Um, I think it's Bemidji and um, I want to say Hutchinson. Um, there is some funding that's been allocated to expand and develop additional homes. But at this point, if we're talking about um, skilled nursing care for individuals over age 55, the four primary locations are Twin Cities, Fergus Falls, Laverne, and Silver Bay. And in order to be eligible for residency at one of these four homes, um, the veteran has to have had the correct service record. And it's, um, it's the veteran or the veteran spouse. But the service record that would be required for admission would be a veteran who has served at least 181 consecutive active duty days or more, um, is over age 55, needs a skilled level of care. So it is possible to be too healthy um, or not meet the clinical criteria for admission to the veteran's home. Um, I've actually had that in my practice where I've had clients that are in an assisted level of care in a community-based assisted living setting and um, were waiting for an opening at the veteran's home. And when that opening came along, their clinical level of care was not high enough um, to be admitted to the veteran's home. So that's something to keep in mind. We're really talking about skilled and advanced levels of care. As I said earlier, this is a benefit that's available not only to the veteran, but also to the spouse of a veteran. Um, and it's important to understand that the Minnesota Veterans Homes maintain a wait list. They have two. One is called the inactive wait list. I like to think of this more as a pool of individuals who may at some point in the future um, be interested in admission. So they put their um, application on file, but they're not on the active wait list. The difference there is the active wait list is like people who, if they were called, there's, um, it's more likely than not that they would meet that clinical level of care and be prepared to um, move and in as a resident. And that's where some of the, um, you know, it can be tricky for families because timing is so critical um, in terms, because we don't know exactly when that bed would become available. So timing can be um, a big part of a plan that may include the Minnesota Veterans Home because sometimes people will need community-based care or skilled care before the bed is actually available to them at the Veterans Home. With regard to the wait list, um, you know, clients and families I'm working with now are reporting that the wait list is longer um, because there was a suspension on new admissions during um, parts of the COVID crisis. So the wait list has gotten to be quite long, even for veterans. Historically, it's been long for spouses, for female um, non-veteran spouses, the wait list has been longer, partly because there are fewer beds, but also, um, I mean, fewer beds and um, just a higher demand. So um, in order to, there are some significant um, considerations when a family is thinking about the veterans home. And for those of you who were with me on part two, you may recall some of the limitations or restrictions around eligibility for medical assistance if you're in a private community-based setting. So these rules that I'm talking about with the state veterans home are really in contrast to the Medicaid rules. So for the veterans home, there is no limit on the amount of assets that a spouse in the community can have. So if one spouse needs to move into the veterans home and one spouse will remain at home in the community, for Medicaid, you may recall, there's some pretty strict limits on what the spouse can have in terms of assets. With regard to the veterans home, there is no limit on what a spouse can have. Um, there are no restrictions on transfers to a spouse. In other words, if one spouse has an asset in his name and he's going to become a resident, he has no limit on being able to transfer assets to the community spouse, as long as that's done uh, prior to the admission. Um, the spouse in the community has to make a decision as to whether or not they will ask for income from the spouse that will become the resident. 
So let's say the spouse who's going to move into the veteran's home has a lot higher income and the spouse who's at home has a nominal social security payment, then it may be that that spouse at home really needs income from the spouse who's going to move into the home. Um, there is a framework for how the veteran's home decides how much that spouse at home can receive. However, if the spouse decides to receive that income, then they are going to be very limited in what they can do with their income and assets. And that would include restrictions such as absolutely no gifting. Um, and then also there are restrictions on the use of assets. So while you have this um, benefit that there's no limitation on the amount of assets, if somebody, for example, takes money out of savings to pay for a veterinary bill for a cat, they may have, that may result in a loss of their income allocation in the following year. So the rules around receiving spousal income are really important to understand for families who are considering taking the spousal income um, because it does have some strings attached, as they say. Um, so, Mary Francis? Yes. May we pause briefly? We have a question here in the chat. Okay. And from one of our out of state guests, do you know if the veterans benefits have extreme differences from one state to another, or have you found that they are somewhat similar? Well, with regard to the state veterans home, they are very unique state to state. So this first benefit I'm talking about is really individual to the state, and you'd want to look more closely at um, your state's veteran home eligibility factors. After we um, conclude this portion, I'll move into a discussion about federal benefits, which will apply to any state. So this um, veteran's home I'm talking about is very state specific. Um, after we transition into the um, other benefits discussion today, it will be broadly applicable. Very good, thank you. So the community spouse, remember that's the word we use to um, name the spouse who's living at home, um, will, to the extent that they have repositioned all of the assets into that person's name, which is pretty typical planning prior to moving somebody into the veteran's home, it would be important for that spouse to review his or her estate plan and make sure that it's appropriate in light of the fact that they have all the assets um, in their name. Historically, um, it was permissible and still is for that spouse at home to execute something called a spousal omission will. A spousal omission will is a will that omits the spouse. So um, that would be fairly routine planning. However, in recent months, we're finding that in the circumstance where the community spouse dies and the veteran home spouse is still living, that the veteran's home is requiring or inquiring about um, the interest of the resident spouse in, in the estate of their predeceased spouse. So if this sounds like Greek to you, it does to most people, um, what I'd say there is if you are a community spouse, if you're working with a community spouse, just please make sure they're getting competent counsel on how to update the estate plan to account for that possibility that even though their spouse is the resident and clearly the one with the higher level of care, um, but it, any, anybody could predecease, right? So especially in COVID, we're thinking about things in a totally different light. So it would be important to have that estate plan reviewed. Um, so really, there, there are some other um, state-specific benefits, including day activity programming, but for today's purposes, that's the Minnesota Veterans Home is the primary one that I have included in this discussion. And now we're going to shift into a broader discussion about federal benefits, and this is the part where um, it would apply to anybody, um, even in other states outside of Minnesota. So with regard to federal veterans benefits, um, there are two branches. So the Veterans Administration breaks the benefits uh, down into these two branches. One is the Veterans Health Administration and the other is the Veterans Benefit Administration. So as you might guess, the Veterans Health Administration 
um, administers the clinics and hospitals um, and other health related resources. Um, this is a system where you need to be admitted. Um, in order to be considered for admission, the veteran has to um, have served at least one day of active duty and had an other than dishonorable discharge. Um, and so that applies to a lot of people. However, that doesn't mean that everybody who applies will get in. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how they make decisions about who gets in. And then, of course, they have a priority system, a ranking system um, for veterans that are admitted in the system. In order to be considered for admission, um, an applicant veteran would have to complete Form 1010 Easy. That's something that is available online. Some people submit it electronically directly through um, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs website. Some people print off a hard copy form and mail it in. In any event, that is the um, admissions form that would need to be submitted along with a copy of the discharge record. Um, if you are working with a veteran, if you are a veteran yourself, you must have your service record. The most common form of a service record is form DD-214, so that's capital D, capital D hyphen 214. If you don't have that, or if you have a photocopy, not a certified copy, it would be important to have that in and among your papers. And you can um, reorder discharge records at um, the National Archives website. Um, so if you need to reorder military discharge records, that would be the place to go. Um, the Veterans Benefit Administration, in contrast, I like to think of that as all the non-health related benefits. So um, home loans, life insurance, um, compensation. Um, so it's those other financial benefits that may be extended to veterans um, as a privilege and a result of their service. So we're gonna look at these two today. Um, taking a closer look at the Veterans Health Administration, um, if we can jump to the next slide, would just to give you a, a high level summary of the type of benefits we're talking about, this would include access to the VA hospitals and nursing homes. In Minnesota, we have one federal VA nursing home um, that is located in St. Cloud. So when I was talking earlier about the Minnesota Veterans Home, that is a state-run facility. There is only one federal nursing home in our state located in St. Cloud. That's another thing that would be state-specific is understanding um, the fed, where the federal nursing homes are located in a given state. Um, the Veterans Health Administration also administers a prescription drug benefit program, outpatient dental for certain qualifying veterans, services for blind, hearing impaired, and um, home and community-based support. So this is where we've seen a proliferation of benefits, uh, an expansion in, um, I'd say, the last probably 10 years, um, the Veterans Administration reacting to, responding to the increased demand and need for support in the community. And this can include things like day activity programming, home care, nurse home visits as an example. And also it includes reimbursement to non-VA providers for um, different services, including home care and day activity programming. So um, this is one of the really important things for veterans and their families to keep in mind if you're building a long-term care plan, that there may be some opportunity for support through um, the Veterans Health Administration. So looking at the Veterans Benefit Administration, again, non-medical, non-health related benefits could include things like service-connected compensation, which we're gonna talk more about, home loans, burial benefits, life insurance, and something called pension. For today's purposes, I'm gonna talk about service-connected compensation and also the last one, pension. Some people, the colloquial term for pension has become aid in attendance. So if that rings a bell for you, um, we will be talking about that today. Uh, first- Mary Alice, uh, one, <laughs> one more question here from Dave when we were talking about the differences between state and federal. Um, he's wondering how do you determine which state applies to the veteran? Does it apply to where they live? It would be um, the domicile or state resident of the veteran. So, you know, for example, my 
dad is a veteran. He lives in Wisconsin for seven months. He lives in Arizona for the other months of the year. He is a Wisconsin resident. And so he, um, for purposes of state benefits, would um, qualify for vet veterans benefits in the state of Wisconsin plus federal benefits. Um, so it looks like there might be another question too regarding discharge records there. Um, so it, the question is, is that discharge record, the DD-214, the same for World War II vets? Yes, it could be. However, um, there are other uh, forms that would constitute a military service record. So not everybody has a DD-214. Some people have other documents that would constitute a valid service record. Um, but the DD-214 tends to be the most common form um, we see. So jumping back to service-connected, what does this mean? Well, service-connected disability means that the veteran suffered a disability or had a condition that was exacerbated by service, meaning it could have been something that existed but got worse. But in any event, it was aggravated um, by the military service. Um, a very common example, very common, would be tinnitus or ringing in the, in the ears or hearing loss. So people that suffered or were exposed to noise damage and resulted in some sort of loss of function in hearing um, or ringing in the ears, uh, this, that's probably the most common service-connected disability rating that I've seen in my um, years of practice in this arena. So the way somebody is deemed service-connected is they will undergo a physical evaluation um, within the VA healthcare system. Sometimes it's part of the admission process. Sometimes when people are already admitted, they may be re-evaluated or evaluated um, for a service-connected rating. Um, if the veteran's service record and health status, if there's what they call a nexus, a connection between the medical condition and the military service, then that may be rated as a service-connected disability. These ratings go in 10% increments. It is possible to have a 0% rating. 0% for hearing loss, as an example, would mean that there's a recognition of some hearing loss, but it doesn't reach a level where it's disabling or it's considered disabling. That may change over time. Somebody could be reevaluated in five years and found to have lost hearing capacity, and then they could um, have their rating increased. Um, it's possible for people to have multiple ratings on different conditions. For example, they may have a 20% hearing loss rating and 100% for prostate cancer due to Agent Orange exposure. So um, veterans can have multiple ratings. Once a rating reaches 70% or higher, that's a pretty significant number within the VA healthcare system because what that means is that veteran would have their health and long-term care paid for through the end of life so long as the veteran um, agrees to receive that care in a VA or VA contracted facility. Um, so that really um, elevates them to a status of, of coverage for care that is very significant and also doesn't have the limitations on what they need to do for their estate plan and what the spouse um, you know, can do with the remaining resources and not having to reposition assets. So that 70% or higher, you know, sometimes I have veterans that are at 60%, they're asking to be reevaluated to see if they can attain that 70% or higher status. Once you get to 10% and higher, that's where you start to see a monthly um, compensation. So 0% um, you don't receive any monetary benefit, but at 10% and, and higher, then the veteran would also be receiving um, a non-taxable monetary um, pension benefit. So somebody who's rated at 10%, I think the numbers between 135 and 140 right now, uh, um, that's 135-ish dollars per month that a veteran would receive for a 10% rating. At 100%, of course, the number is much higher, but then we're dealing with somebody who is really catastrophically disabled 
and that disability would prevent them from work. Um, so as you might imagine, service connected, again, connected to service, exacerbated by service, we can directly link it to the military service. There is something called non-service connected pension, meaning there's a recognition that a veteran may be suffering from a disability, a disabling condition um, that was not directly caused by military service, but the VA offers a pension benefit uh, for veterans who were not disabled as a result of service if they served at least 90 consecutive active days one of those 90 days had to have fallen during a wartime or conflict period and what that means is not oh i had to have been you know in vietnam in combat it could be somebody who was behind a desk in Quantico, Virginia. So it just means the person was on active duty while the United States was engaged in a wartime or conflict period for at least one of those consecutive 90 days. Um, of course, we, uh, the, the main um, wartime eras we deal with in elder law practice would be World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And um, so you'd want to look at the discharge record to determine whether or not the veteran was on active duty during that wartime or conflict period. Um, and then the discharge has to have been other than dishonorable. So it could be for medical or other, um, but it has to have been under honorable conditions. And if that the veteran has that service record, then the veteran and or the surviving spouse of veteran can potentially qualify for this non-service connected pension. Now, this is the benefit that I talked about earlier that people, there's a misnomer, they call it aid in attendance. I'm gonna try and demystify where that comes from today, but the proper term, if you were dealing with somebody within the VA system is non-service connected pension. Um, so to make it even more confusing, non-service connected pension has two flavors. One is if the veteran is alive, it's called improved disability pension. If the veteran is not living and there is a surviving spouse that is trying to access the benefit on the service record of the predeceased veteran spouse, that's referred to as improved death pension. Um, so how do they determine who's eligible? So if you have the right service record, that's just like the ticket to step in the gates and see, do we qualify clinically and financially? Um, so if we can jump to the next slide, the um, eligibility, once you have the right service record, then we have to look at the claimant, and that's the word the VA uses instead of applicant, they use the word claimant, that's C-L-A-I-M-A-N-T, claimant. Um, they look to see if the claimant has clinical need, and do they meet the financial criteria? So just like the veteran's home, you have to have some sort of a disabling condition. Um, so um, you can't just sign up because it sounds like a good thing and you're hoping to get some additional financial support. You have to prove clinical and financial need. So how do we do that? Well. Within the VA system, they have their own way for calculating income. So income in VA world is referred to as IVAP, that's an acronym, income for VA purposes, okay? So I like to think of it as, you know, we're kind of entering the twilight zone, right? The, the VA world has their own definitions for determining who's eligible for this program. The way they determine income is they take the gross income, that's the number that's before anything's taken out. So if you get Medicare, for example, there's a, the big number, and then there's the number that actually gets deposited in the bank. VA uses the big number before anything's taken out, like your Medicare premium. So gross income minus all unreimbursed medical expenses um, that is how income is determined. And we're gonna look at some examples because I know this is really hard to wrap your mind around just in words. So um, hang with me because we will look at some examples that I, that I hope will help illustrate what we're talking about here. So first, understanding clinical need. Clinical need means you have to have the right um, 
need for support. And there's two ratings. These are medical ratings within the VA healthcare system or within the VA system to determine if somebody qualifies for this non-service connected pension. So the two ratings, medical ratings, are called housebound and aid in attendance. And that is determined by being examined by a physician. And I've referred to a rating form here um, just um, kind of for your information because some people are in the midst of applying for this benefit. Um, so let's take a closer look at what does it mean to be housebound. Housebound is a medical rating that does not provide, and if we can jump to the next slide, um, does not provide as much of a reimbursement as aid and attendance. So aid and attendance is the highest monetary reimbursement. Housebound's like a middle ground. But the VA defines housebound as when somebody is essentially confined to the dwelling or the house or the, wherever the house is, and the immediate premises, you know, in and around the house. And it's, um, you know, reasonably certain that the disability um, and the confine confinement are going to continue for the rest of the veteran or the surviving spouse's lifetime. Okay, so this is somebody who's basically not getting out of the house very much, if at all, and if they are, it's with substantial assistance. So aid and attendance, again, another medical rating. This is where the highest monetary benefit comes from. And I think that's why in elder services, this program became known as aid and attendance because people who get rated for aid and attendance see the highest reimbursement rating. And that's because the VA defines uh, someone who's in need of regular aid and attendance as somebody who can, needs assistance with dressing bathing, that's the first bullet point. So needing assistance with uh, getting dressed, with taking a bath, uh, maybe somebody who needs frequent adjustment of a prosthetic or orthopedic appliance or device, and can, they cannot handle that without assistance, um, needs support with feeding him or herself, um, inability to attend to the wants of nature, that's the VA's way of saying incontinence, and then of course, we have the incapacity, um, physical or mental, which requires assistance to make sure that the claimant is protected from hazards and dangers. That sounds a lot like dementia or cognitive decline. Um, and so there's that need for a protective environment. So really, again, if you're familiar with, uh, or if you remember us talking last time about need for support with activities of daily living, or need for a protective environment due to dementia or related disorders, that's, that is somebody who would likely qualify for aid and attendance rating. So once somebody is deemed to have the clinical level of care, then we look at the financial side and try and figure out if they meet the requirements for eligibility under the program. So again, we're gonna be looking at income um, within the VA system, they have a maximum annual pension rate currently for a married veteran. That's about $2,266 a month is the maximum award. Okay, so if we can jump to the next uh, slide. This is just a clip from the Department of Veterans Affairs website. Um, this is looking at the um, pension rate table for a veteran who has a dependent spouse. So this would be a um, wartime veteran who has a spouse. And you can see these are annual figures. And there is something called low income pension, meaning I'm not, I don't have a medical rating. I'm not housebound or I don't qualify for aid and attendance. But if somebody is just has low income, and they're a wartime veteran, they may qualify for this lowest benefit, that's the 18,000 number, that's referred to as low income pension. Then you can see housebound and aid and attendance I highlighted because again, that's the program most people are familiar with because it's the highest rating. And for example, if somebody's in assisted living, receiving support with two or more of their ADLs, or if they're in memory care, they're almost certainly gonna be rated for aid and attendance that current number, this number changes every December 1st. It's adjusted slightly for inflation. Um, and so that's the annual maximum award for aid and attendance. So if we divide that by 12, you get 2,266. So that's 
where I got that number. So if you are thinking about that, if you have somebody who's in assisted living, for example, and needs a little extra help paying for um, that each month, this aid in attendance, this non-service connected pension with the aid in attendance rating may help with that. So I'm gonna pause there just to see if we have um, any questions at this point that, uh, since we just went through quite a bit, do we have any questions sure. at this point? Yeah, thank you. So someone is asking, what about single person's income versus the dependent spouse? So my examples today are all focused on the example with a married veteran, but these rate tables are available for surviving spouse, for single veteran. Just to give you a ballpark number, it's about, I think it's 17 or 1800 a month um, for, a, for a single veteran, which is around that 20,000. And then for a surviving spouse, it's around 1300 a month maximum award. And again, you just multiply that times 12. But you can find these rate tables at the, the Department of Veterans Affairs website. It's a big, long rate table. And then you have to look at, if is, is it a surviving spouse? Is it a single veteran? There's a table for two veterans living together in need of aid and attendance. But for today's purposes, most of my examples are um, a married veteran um, just because we otherwise would be here until four o'clock which I'm fine with but you guys may have other things to do um, was there any other questions Shelley there is one more question thank you is it more difficult to prove mental incapacity versus physical incapacity to receive aid and attendance in my experience, um, no. Um, if we're dealing with a dementia diagnosis, mild cognitive impairment, um, you know, dementia or related disorder, um, then it's not. It's it's a physician statement. So that form I referred to earlier, that you know, twenty six dash, you know, uh, I can't remember, but that is filled out by a medical provider who has examined the claimant. So if somebody has a memory loss diagnosis, that is typically going to be, as long as it can be substantiated by a medical provider, um, a doctor that has examined the claimant and will certify that in writing, um, it's not going to be um, you know, a, a higher bar, so to speak, than proving somebody's in need of support with their ADLs. And then I see, um, oh, Dave just said, does it need to be somebody within the VA system? No, not necessarily. That form can be completed by a community-based doctor. Um, it does not um, require somebody being admitted. So access to the non-service connected pension, people can apply for pension and not be in the VA healthcare system. So they could be living you know, at Emerald Crest in memory care, have never been enrolled as a patient in the VA healthcare system, they have a physician calling on them at the memory care community, and that physician could complete um, the medical form that would be needed to um, substantiate the clinical level um, for purposes of qualifying for this non-service connected pension. So let's take a look at a more specific example. I hope this will help illustrate um, how this program works. So in my example, I have a married veteran living in an assisted living facility. Um, the gross household income is about 3000 per month. Remember, gross is that number that's before anything's taken out. Um, but don't worry, because aid and attendance, the, the, the non-service connected pension, allows you to deduct all medical expenses from income. So in my example here, the deductible monthly medical expenses, which include Medicare premiums, supplemental Medicare premiums, over-the-counter incontinence supplies, in my example here, it's probably the largest medical expense. The highest is the assisted living services and rent. That's, that's a deductible medical expense, even the rent portion. So here we have 5,700 a month in deductible medical expenses. So we take our income and we're gonna subtract those expenses and that's gonna give us, remember, income for VA purposes which is different than IRS income or you know, income for other definitions. This is just VA. So here we have 3,000 a month of fixed income. We have $5,700 in medical expenses. So that's a shortfall every month for this family of $2,700. So the income this 
claimant reports to the VA is zero. Why not minus 2,700? Because they don't allow you to go into the red or negative. You just, if you're below, you just go default to zero. So um, most people I'm working with, if they're in assisted living, memory care, um, they automatically go to zero because it's very rare that I have somebody whose income is more than their monthly cost in a community-based care setting. So here, our in reportable income is zero dollars. Um, and so the way I would estimate for this family what their maximum monthly award is, is I'd say the maximum award is $2,266 for a married veteran, but they have to subtract their income for VA purposes. Here it's zero. So I would be telling this family, you can anticipate to be awarded the maximum award. Okay, and that's what they could reasonably expect, assuming they meet the asset criteria, which we're going to talk about right now. So um, with regard to the financial analysis for this program, the VA is going to look at the monthly income and the total assets. And in this program had a major overhaul that went into effect in, on October uh, 1st of 2018. Um, so before October of 2018, the rules were totally different. There was no look back on gifting. Um, there, was a, there, there was something called the sufficient means standard for purposes of determining how much in assets. It was, there was no bright line standard. So it was very hard to administer this program consistently across the country. Congress recognized that starting in 2015, they started to examine this program, largely because of the amount of financial abuse by annuity providers that were having some predatory practices um, in applying for this pension. So Congress started looking at it more and then finally acted and changed the rules, made the announcement in September of 18 that went into effect in October. So now, um, so if you're familiar with this program, if you're a senior housing professional or something, make sure you know that there have been major changes. Now there is a net worth bright line limit, um, which is currently $127,061. Um, this is a federal um, community spouse resource allowance that's prescribed by Congress annually. Um, so the current number is 127061. This means that a person applying for pension has to add um, all of their income for VA purposes. Remember, that's the amount, the gross income minus medical expenses. They have to take that annual number and add it to their available assets. That is very unusual, but they take annual income and a and add it to the claimant's assets. And that is considered a veteran's or a claimant's net worth for purposes of determining eligibility for this program. Um, and so assets include all property owned by the claimant um, and their dependents, meaning spouse, including real estate and personal property um, with some exceptions. So let's take a look at those exceptions. So you know, those of you who were with me last time or in the time before, um, we always, lawyers always give the bright line rule and then we start going into the exceptions. So the bright line rule is any property owned by the veteran and the veteran spouse, except the home with up to two acres adjacent. So if you have somebody who's on a homestead and has 50 acres, you only get an exemption for the house and the two acres surrounding. The 48 acres adjacent would be considered available, part of the available asset pool. Um, also ignored or ex you know, exempt would be personal effects, you know, clothing, jewelry, um, personal items in and about the home place. One thing that's interesting, this is different than Medicaid, is that the claimant could have that home and let's say they're, um, they're allowing another family member to live there or maybe you know one spouse is living at home and the other spouse moves into memory care, the home is considered exempt even if the claimant isn't living there. 
So even if it's a single person, a surviving spouse who's in the nursing home or other facility, and they still have their home, the home is considered exempt. So you don't factor in the equity or the value of that home when you're figuring out net worth, even if the owner isn't living there. Um, in Medicaid, that's not true. You have got to, if you're not living in the home under Medicaid, of course, they're gonna expect you to sell it and use the proceeds to pay for care. Um, if the home is sitting there and you know a grandchild's living in it, it can have that exception. But if it's later sold, well then the, the surviving spouse or the claimant can reinvest in another home within 12 months However, if it's just sold and then the money goes into the bank account, the proceeds from the sale would need to be reported to the VA. And that's um, a, a situation where they're likely, depending on how much it is, um, it's, it, it's, the eligibility be, would be reevaluated and to the extent it puts the claimant over the threshold, then um, they would be found to have excessive net worth and benefits would be terminated. Um, so let's take, a, again, I'm gonna try and break this down and look at a real example. So here we have a married veteran with income for VA purposes of $1,000 a month, that's 12,000 per year. And remember, income for VA purposes, this veteran, the household income could be 4,000, but I've subtracted out all the unreimbursed medical. So that what's left after the unreimbursed medical is $1,000 a month. The, this particular married veteran has available assets of 117,000, okay? That's not including the house and personal effects. That could be a retirement account and some CDs or cash in the bank. But in any event, we add it all up and we get 117. So I'm gonna take that income of 12,000, add it to the 117, that gives us the net worth for purposes of determining pension eligibility. So here, that's this, you know, the 12 plus 117, of course, 129. Remember I said the threshold is 127.061. Um, so this claimant would have excessive net worth because 129 is more than 127. Now, that's a situation where I might say, go and pre-fund your funeral arrangements in a, you know, a, a funeral or burial plan to bring you down below that 127. So there are ways to, to permissibly reduce excessive net worth, but if this person didn't know any better, reported their income, reported their assets, they would be denied because they're above that bright line threshold. So that, since October of 2018, that's how this program is being administered, okay? Bright line standard, you're either above or below. If you're below, you're eligible. Um, so let's take a look at another example. Again, here's a situation where the income for VA purposes is zero, probably because let's say they're in assisted living or memory care and their cost of care is more than their monthly income. Same amount of available assets, 117. So we're adding zero to 117 because we have no reportable income here. Okay, it's all being wiped out by medical expenses. And so here, um, you, I think you'd agree, we're below the 127.061 because our net worth is 117. And this is somebody who would be under the net worth limit and deemed um, eligible on that basis. So again, net worth includes income. So um, low or no income is critical to getting the maximum award. There's a direct um, correlation between high medical expenses and maximum award. Okay, um, income you, again is lowered by deducting those allowable medical expenses. The list of what's considered allowable is quite expansive. It includes things like you know over the counter, um, you know like it could be baby aspirin if it's physician um, recommended. It could of course any out of pocket prescription drug costs, um, medical insurance, long term care insurance. They're really relying on the IRS's definition of deductible medical expenses, plus it's, it's somewhat expanded. As part of the overhaul for pension, they also added a sixth activity of daily living, um, which recognizes that there could be somebody who's ambulatory but has difficulty getting around their home. And so any support for activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living 
will likely be deemed a permissible medical expense that could be subtracted from the income. So um, just keeping in mind that the VA has quite an expansive list of what's included as a permissible medical expense to lower that income. One of the other big changes, if we can jump to the next slide, um, in 2018 for non-service connected pension um, was the imposition of a look back period. Before October of 18, there was no look back period on this program, meaning people could gift a bunch of assets away and then they could apply the next day. Um, so at, um, at, oh, and again, I'm looking, I was saying October 1st, I wanna make sure we're clear, it's October 18th, 2018. So any gifts that happened before October 18th, 2018 would be disregarded, ignored, doesn't, doesn't cause a penalty. But if the gift happened on October 18th or later, then um, a penalty could be imposed for having gift or transferred or given away any property that was owned by the claimant, okay? Um, so, and they use the, they use a penalty divisor, meaning um, they have an amount, how do they calculate, like how long the penalty is going to be, we'll look at an example. Um, the penalty starts to run one month after the month of the gift, um, and the maximum penalty is five years. So even if somebody transferred, you know, a million dollars, and then you factor that out and it's 15 or 20 year penalty or something like that, the max is five years that you can be penalized for gifting. But that's still a pretty long time for somebody who's asset and income limited. So, um, so let's look at an example. Um, so here, the claimant had given a son $50,000 for a divorce lawyer in August of 2018. Claimant then applies for pension at the time of application, has a net worth of 126. Remember, 127061. So is the claimant financially eligible? Yeah, because that gift happened before October 18th, 2018. Let's jump to example number two. Same, same example, claimant gives son 50,000 for a divorce lawyer in November of 18, then applies for pension and has a net worth of only 75,000. Is the claimant financially eligible? This is kind of a trick question because that $50,000 gift happened after October 18th. However, because the net worth is 75, you add that to the 50, you get 125. That's less than 127. So because it wasn't, an, it wasn't money that was over and above 127, it's, it's okay. Because the gift was made out of that exempt asset pool. So here's a circumstance where a gift was made but given the total net worth picture, it's not going to negatively impact um, the claimant, okay? Let's jump to number three. A sick claimant gives that 50,000 for the divorce. It happened in November of 18. We know that's past the cutoff, so we have, to, we have to consider it. In this case, instead of 75, this claimant has a net worth of 95, right? So when we add those two together, we are now over the 127 and because of that uh, because of that a penalty will be imposed so you can see how gifts um, need to be closely um, evaluated if you're considering applying for pension it may or may not make a difference depending on when the gift happened how much it was and what the net worth of the applicant is and remember net worth is income plus available assets this is, um, you know, there's, it's a program that is very nuanced in terms of determining whether or not somebody is eligible, okay? So um, again, if we jump to that, my last example, how would they determine the penalty? Well, they take the amount of the gift, $50,000, divide it by that maximum award. Remember I said the maximum award for a married veteran and that that penalty divisor applies to single um, veterans and single surviving veterans too they just take the maximum 2266 so this would result in a 22 month denial of coverage 
but it would the denial would start in December of 18. So even if somebody was applying later, they get to run the penalty from starting back to the the month following the month in which the gift was made. So at least there's that. In Medicaid, the penalty starts running on the day you apply. So that is one advantage. Um, so just to orient us, we are still talking about the non-service connected pension that is commonly referred to as aid in attendance. Historically, I've, I've talked about the fact that this program had a lot of um, interested people, financial um, service companies that were selling annuities and other insurance products as a means by which they tried to get people quickly eligible for the program. In light of that, these major changes to the program that happened in 2018 included an absolute prohibition on funding an annuity. SPIA, that word I have in line one, S-P-I-A stands for single, premium immediate annuity and it prior to 2018 and for the for the five years before there were rampant use of annuities trying to expedite or speed up the time it took to get eligible for this pension program and as a result of that um, congress said no more no more so um, also there were specific types of trusts that people were using to try and reduce their net worth to qualify more easily for this program. That was not happening really in Minnesota so much because we have some interesting trust laws as it relates to long-term care planning. But in any event, um, if you have somebody telling you uh, the use of an annuity or a trust for purposes of qualifying for VA benefits is a good idea, you wanna be very, very, very careful. Okay, very careful because the rules around those issues have changed. So um, you just want to make sure you're getting really good guidance in that regard. So that really concludes just to sort of review where we've been. We talked about the state level benefits primarily focusing on um, the state veterans home. We talked about the Veterans Health Administration, VHA. Um, how to qualify service connected, um, what additional benefits may flow from being a patient in that healthcare system. And then we wrapped up with this conversation about the non-service connected pension, commonly referred to as aid and attendance. Those are the three primary um, sources or programs that I see people trying to access in the context of building a long-term care plan. But I'll say this, veterans benefits are expansive, um, and so it's, if you are a veteran or a qualifying family member, surviving spouse, it's important to get some really good guidance. And there are um, a lot of resources, free resources. Um, we have a state law in Minnesota that anybody providing assistance to you and accessing veterans benefits has to disclose that there are free resources like the veteran service officers in each county and veteran service organizations. So, um, so I hope this is helpful in at least beginning to demystify some of these programs. Um, and I'm happy to take any additional questions about it. And we have one question here in the chat and referencing gifting. Is jewelry considered a gift? So, you know, in you think back, um, personal effects are generally disregarded for purposes of determining eligibility. I'd say a caveat is if somebody has, I mean, even, you know, really nice engagement rings worth, you know, $20,000, $30,000, I've never seen that, um, some, like mom giving something like that to a child or grandchild as a disqualifying event, because in general, that, that it would be um, deemed a personal effect. Um, I'm thinking of a situation years ago where I had somebody who asked me as part of a Medicaid spend down, um, could they purchase like uh, four Rolex watches and would that be considered, you know, an exempt spend down and that was found to be not permissible. So I think, you know, there's always um, an exception, but the general rule in my experience would be jewelry is treated as a personal effect and it's typically disregarded for purposes of determining eligibility. 
Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the chat at this time. Okay. Okay. Well, Mary, thank you so much for for the last three sessions, estate planning, planning for long-term care, and today VA benefits. You have just uh, offered so much guidance here. And like to your point on the nuances of all this and the details, um, for folks on the call, please, you can see Mary's information on the screen, uh, handouts, uh, as well as a CEU certificate, if it applies, uh, will be sent out to all attendees uh, via email. Um, as soon as we are able to get that out. I think it will probably be next week. Um, and with that, uh, we have a location guide here too. Uh, Shelly, would you care to share? Sure, yeah, the location guide will actually be part of the handouts that you receive. Great. So again, highlighting uh, the states in which we serve and the different levels of care and services in each of those states. Wonderful. And um, so again, uh, Mary, thank you. And uh, for those on the call, look at, uh, look at the uh, CassiaLife.org website for more webinars in the future. Email Christine Drasher if you are uh, thinking of topics that you think might um, uh, resonate with yourself and others. We link up with the experts like Mary to bring you um, timely topics and and great webinars so again mary thank you so much for your time and thank you all for attending today we really appreciate it thank you you bet thank you